as a team of, of bayonets joining us here in this room um, to all of you and best to your work. For your voluntary work today, I room um, all the respect to all of you and best all the best to your work, for your voluntary work. And we are going to talk about Winter Games today. I, I know lots of you have already known quite a bit about the Winter Games and, and Winter Sports, but today we're going to talk about the venues, the design of the venues. And um, in particular, I'm going to talk about a design approach, which is called Urban Ergonomics is how to make these venues more sustainable. Um, we'll start from this problem. You know, th 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 there is a word as white elephant, or white elephants. Mm -hmm. Olympic structures are not known to be very usable or well used, mostly after the games. And this is Greece, this is... US and Atlanta, and they are big, gigantic, monumental structures inside the city that people, normal people, cannot use. And most of them um, have issues of a sustainable use in daily life. Um, they don't have very great endings, usually, and you, you do see dilapidated structures inside the city. It's basically a great memory of the games and then a very poor post-game reuse ending up in all this kind of white elephant issues. So the question is why, why are they white elephants? Why do this kind of white elephant exist? Why is it so difficult for the Olympic venues so difficult to use after the games? You know, it's very easy um, to simply um, say that it, it's a managerial issue. It, it's all about administration, it's, it's the government, it's the managers of the venues. They don't know how to use it, they don't know how to plan it into daily life. But as an architect, there is a responsibility that we cannot shy away from. There is a design issue inside this problem. Let's look at this, a ski jump. Almost all the sports facilities for Olympic Games, they are designed for a particular type of human body, usually superhuman bodies that has been trained for a long time to perform different difficult positions or very difficult extreme movements. Let's look at this. This is a ski jump. You see the loop, the cycle of a ski jump from the in-run to the takeoff to the flying and to the landing. And if we look at the next image, this is the body weight you are carrying in one of your knees. Ski jumping is not a very symmetrical game. Usually one foot always lands a very short time before the other. So for a very short time, you are required at this landing to carry about 5.5 times body weight on one single foot. If we compare this to all other normal day life sports, from walking, from running, from volleyball, which is quite symmetrical usually, and then to a running or this kind of extreme running inside the city. It is definitely the hardest to perform. Basically, you would be carrying 11 times your body weight on both your feet when you do that landing. Um, very challenging indeed. And that is not all. During the flying, and in particular during the takeoff, your speed 
would reach about 80 kilometers per hour. And that's why um, they do this kind of trainings, because usually you, you don't accelerate to that speed. And you're not born to take that speed. This is normal. Let's wait. Two more bars. Okay. So, let's see the body positions. This is when you walk. This is when you walk up a stair. This is when you do hiking, climbing up a slope. And this is when you do the in-run in the ski jump. Look at these extreme body positions. The difficult angles that your knee, your thigh and your ankle need to reach is basically pushing your envelope, the envelope of your body to the extreme. So on one hand, we have all the superhuman behaviours that has been trained. And then on the other hand, all the instinct movements and body position that we are born with, how to mix up the two. All the game structures, they are designed for the superhumans, supermen and superwomen. And then for daily live use, you have to design a facility that can be used by our daily movement and daily life. And that is the question that we are going to address today. So, let's move away from the Winter Games a bit. Let's move into the genre of ergonomics. It's basically design things according to the need of our human bodies. And urban ergonomics is designing our city, all the built environment and built spaces, to the need of our human body. There are five scale and five kind of technology or five set of tools that can help us do this. The biggest scale is the mackerel scale. It's very large, over 2.5 kilometers. No one would walk this distance. This is basically how you understand the connection within the city. And then secondly, there is the far scale. There's about 15, 10 minutes to 15 minutes of cycling. And then two kilometers, medium scale. Usually we are speaking of a urban street and 15 minutes of walking um, is the neighborhood or community that you would live with. And then the near scale is about 100 meters or 50 meters. This is a building scale or a small public plaza and all the way to the very skin of our body, um, which is the micro scale. It is where um, all the things that we can reach, we can touch, without moving our body. So the macro scale, now we have all this data technology to record, to register how people move, and people would be regarded as dots. The, the, the distribution of the dots, the clouds of the dots, would reveal some collective human nature. And by the way, that image is from um, one of my best friends, is Professor Carlarati in MIT, um, and one of the early images he usually used in promotion of, of his studies um, in the Sensible City Lab in MIT. And in the far scale, um, our current technology would help us to actually identify all the movement of the single body, of the individuals. They will be regarded as vectors. You have a collection of, of thousands, of hundreds of, of vectors moving inside the space. And then in the medium scale, we have more tools and more and more tools, actually. Um, when you have a volunteer, and it's very easy to identify the body position, the positioning of your arm, the speed of your movement, um, the angle of, of, of your um, arm and, and legs, 
and then it reveals um, some of um, your interaction with the space. And also, it's possible to track the movement of your eye, what you see, what you are seeing, what you're paying attention to, what interests you, what you hate. Um, getting closer, and things are getting more interesting, and this time we need some volunteers to do it because you need to wear some technology um, to get the data that's on your body, all the sensors, and then a reading of your facial expression. This can be an ethical um, problem. Um, normally we don't use it, but when you use it, it is incredibly accurate, shall we say, and different people, even, even if you are from different parts of the world, and people's facial expressions share incredibly common similar feature. For example, we can actually read all your facial expression showing interest or contempt in the class. Um, micro scale, um, we need more technology, we need more detail, oh my goodness. We need a network connection. But we will continue. Um, Eli will do the job. She is definitely the best in Tsinghua of solving all these kind of issues. Um, we, we, we can have more technology. Uh, actually, it penetrates the envelope of your body all the way into the inside. We can measure the electric movement inside the waves, inside your brain. We can analyze um, the, the activity of your muscles, we, we can analyze all these details and reveals more of you. If you remember, there is the liar test machine. Actually, in the 1950s, they are part of this muscle activity measurement. So, if we have this five scales and five set of tools, how do we use them? How do we use this framework of urban ergonomics to try to tackle the issue of winter game facility reuse? The underlying idea is incredibly simple. We combine the need of the common body, of the common man, with the need of the body of the superman. We combine them. We don't select either or, it's both and. Let's start with the National Ski Jumping Centre of Beijing 2022. Ski jumps, they are not known to be easily used after the games. Actually, they are notorious in this regard. Most ski jumps of the Winter Games after 2000, they are not very well used. Why? Easy. There are not many ski jumpers out there. In Europe, um, and the most, what a ski jump is most popular in countries like Austria, Germany, Poland, um, Slovenia, probably Slovenia has the best um, racial and the highest percentage of ski jumpers per population. But, but ski jump is not a sport that you do after a day of classes. You don't do that before a meal. You have to train yourself for over 15 years to be able to actually jump in a winter game ski jump. So these things they are not easy to reuse. If you compare all the four, five ski jumps prior to the Beijing one, after the turn of the 21st century, we do see some difference. They are much simpler than ours. They have the slope, they have the hills, they have the spectators stand, and they don't have many other parts. We do. The redundancy, redundancy of additional elements inside our ski jump. So let's do a comparison, starting from the macro scale. 
This is Pyeongchang in Korea. Look, these are the training hills and these are the competition hills. Two hills inside the Rauki mountain. You don't get very close to these hills. And please pay attention, these things are called hills. These tracks are called hills in, in, in the ski jumping sport terms. You can't reach to these hills. Not the in run, not the landing. You can get inside the stadium or you can take a car and take a ride all the way to the top and then take a lift up to that disc. That is a can canteen and a small exhibition room. It is not connected um, with the hills anyway. So let's say this entire experience, if you are a common man visiting this Olympic structure, you know the sport, but you're not going to take that ski jump, then what do you do? Not many things to do. You see it, you take a picture, and then take the bus, you get onto the bus, and get, there, get off the bus, take a picture, and then get onto the bus again. So it's a broken kind of experience. It's a broken chain of interactivity between you and the venues. Normally, um, next to the ski jumps, you have two other venues. One is the cross country and the other is biathlon. The only difference between these two venues is one includes shooting range, the other doesn't. But for whatever reasons, because they are two federations, they do have two similar fields next to the ski jump. And the entire thing, these three venues, the cross country, the biathlon and the ski jump, they are caught together as usually the Nordic cluster. So this is the Nordic cluster in Pyeongchang. If we do a typological diagram of Pyeongchang, it's like this. The dotted line indicates that the connection in between these places, you have to use vehicular traffic. You have to use vehicles. You can't do it on foot which also means that your experience of the entire cluster is broken. Let's see the difference between this and what we are doing in Beijing. We have a connected footbridge, a half ring actually connecting the cross country and the biathlon, and also director leads you to the entrance of the stadium beneath the ski jump. And even for the ski jump itself, you have a loop of pedestrian path around, around it, as far as you don't have vertical fear. So let's see the difference. The difference is like this. The basic components of these venues, they're all sports facilities, are the same, but the connection and the design is different. Where in Pingchan you have the dotted lines, you have the broken experience. In Beijing, in Zhangjiakou, you have the connected experience. And for the ski jump, when the stadium and the peak is actually disconnected, and here in Beijing we are making them connected. So that's what we are planning for the post-game use. You have the cross-country, you walk above the footbridge, you can enter the ski jump, and then you can also walk all the way to the biathlon. So this is what we have now. Do note that the peak club is actually connected with the ski jumps. So you have an unbroken 
possible path of experience the entire thing. But this view is done by a drone, is not done by any human beings. We have a UFO-like peak club on the top, over 4,000 square meters of space. This is for the Superman, for the athletes. Superman doing some super stuff. But do note these stairs, they are for the common. Cross country, and we're flying over the valley to see the ski jump performing as a landmark. So this entire plan, we, we did some early test. It has not been mass tested. We have to do that test properly post the Winter Games, when, when all of you would say, go there with your family um, to spend a weekend. But this is some early test we, we've done with some volunteers. Um, we are analysing the movement of the eyes and this heat map these are the hot spots where you pay attention to um, it proves um, some of our early speculations but all of these needs to be tested further let's Look at some more detailed things that we have done in terms of ergonomic thing. The first thing is what I call, and this is very interesting, the common man's moment of a superman. Look, this is when the original FIS, you know FIS, F-I-S, Federation International Skiing, and when they designed the track, and the track designer is very... Um, brilliant um, engineer. He's from Germany, about 2.2 meters tall, almost as tall as the ski jump. Um, but but he doesn't do. He's not a ski jumper himself. But he has all the possible software and, and, and formula of calculation um, of of doing the calculations for the ski jumpers. So he has designed over 400 ski jump tracks. And all the hills you see after the turn of the 21st century of international for World Cup or for World Championship was designed by him. So he is an indispensable choice when we are looking for a track profile. He designed the profile and he's very experienced. And this profile, when the hills are Located in such an orientation, you have the minimum requirement of land work. The excavation is around 200,000 cubic meters less than when you do the ski jump in this orientation. But we have somehow discussed with Hans Martin Rehn, the German, and also Walter Hoffer, 
the director of the ski jumping sport in Fizz, to rotate from this to this. Why? This is the common man's moment of a superman. Every ski jumper is more or less a superman or a superwoman. But when he or she stands at the starting point, there's usually a 0 0.3 second of a glimpse of the environment. Because when you start ski jumping, your attention will be entirely focused on finding the wind, the movement, the shaping of your body, to try to fly as far as possible. But it is this 0 0.3 seconds that give the ski jumper a very brief impression of the environment. And this is entirely psychological. Do you know before Beijing, which ski jump was the most popular among athletes? It's in Whistler, Canada, near Vancouver. Because you have a Indian, of uh, uh, the Aboriginal Indian, sacred mountain in front of the ski jump. So when he or she does this 0 0.3 seconds of glimpse, there's always a drive of the ski jumper to jump, to fly to that mountain. And here, there is another drive. After we turn the ski jump this way, this 0 0.3 seconds you're no longer jumping into this very low hill, but you are jumping all the way into the valley. And here you do see a very blurry line. It is the ruins of the Great War 400 years ago. If you don't believe it, you know, optically, when you, the things are evenly lit, if you can see it, it would be able to see you. So you see the ruins of the Great War here. So in Beijing 2022, athletes will be told that the ski jumpers feel lucky that you would be jumping into the Great War. <laughs> and this is the landmark effect of, of the cantilevered disc or the peak club. You see it everywhere inside the mountain range, from the hotels, from, from, from the roads, and also from this footbridge. There is a story about this footbridge. Um, around three years ago or four years ago, when there was an early preliminary conceptual studies of this place, a Swiss team, very creatively, they proposed that you have five Olympic rings, why don't you stack all these five rings together to form a five-story building surrounding the entire small hill here? It will be an Olympic landmark. Great idea. You, you all know what Apple is doing in San Francisco in their new headquarters, gigantic ring. Um, but that would be too romantic and too idealistic. Um, we can't do that because we need, you don't do a five-story building inside a valley, but what we can do is to take the idea of connecting these two cross-country and biathlon venues and also the ski jump at the same time, the footbridge for the pedestrians, which will be used after the games, will be lifted away from the land of the mountain, which is very good for restoring all the um, mountain flora in the surface of the mountain. And additionally, you have this 1.6 kilometers of pedestrian path, which can also be used after the games. Maybe you can do it um, when, when you do the loop. You can have a half marathon um, happening on the footbridge. And when you walk along the footbridge, you, you do have this thing as a landmark. And it, it gives you the rhythm of experience the space. 
Again, we do, did some preliminary tests. We asked two runners to wear some gear, of ergonomic human factor measurement gear. And then we tested their speed. And basically, it, this, the gray line indicates the change of speed if you are doing this running without any visual interference, without any visual interest. This is the change of speed. It changes with the slope. But with the intervention of this gigantic ski jump, you see um, there is a similar change of the speed. Um, when you run, when your speed becomes slower, it indicates that something is getting you interested or you are getting exhausted. Um, also, along the two jumping hills, we have a series of stairs, actually a redundancy of stairs leading up to the top of the ski jump and then all the way down. And here, let me tell you a rule of thumb observation. is the 2.5 hours slow movement experience. If you can have 2.5 hours of slow movement inside a place, then it can create a pretty complete experience of this place. And this place has the potential of becoming a destination. And this is exactly that. You have the stadium and then you go up. You spend maybe 40 minutes inside this peak club and then go down. We have another volunteer. This time we have to cover his face for obvious reasons. And then when he moves up and down and experiencing this place, we recorded his facial expression. Quite rich, isn't it? Um, show some fear, um, some thrilling effect, um, some enjoyment, and some hatred, indeed, getting bored. And also the side of the ski jump, they are designed to be part of the wind protection. You have to protect the landings in particular from wind, because when, if the wind is too strong, the ski jumpers will blow away. It will be extremely dangerous, it will be fatal. So you have to maintain the side wind beneath three, three meters per second. And um, you need, uh, of course, the mountain is already doing some wind protection, but you need further wind protection. We, after the wind calculation, and this is the geometry we achieved, they are not symmetrical. You, you see, and some people argue that sh when, you, when you do such a thing, indicating a Chinese object, it needs to be symmetrical. Um, but they are not. And I think they are good. Um, so we need very little wind protection in the side. And then these are the things that um, work particularly for the athletes. I don't think we need to go through that detail. And when we move up, when you have this very unique peak club, it's a ring-shaped structure. But look, the back is deeper. The front is narrower. So and when you have support in the back, the cantilevered structure is lighter, it's, very, um, it's much easier to achieve. And 4,000 square meters of space, if you don't have the concept of how big is 4,000 square meters, this room is around 200. So there's 20 of this kind of room um, inside that space. So when you have such a top, when you, it's uh, accessible, it creates a drive, again, for people to go there. And from there, beneath there, you have the full view of the entire valley. Some unique 
geometry. And interestingly, even AI, contemporary AI, they don't predict such buildings exist. When you test such a building and feed it into an AI program, one of the best AI programs, Luminar, when you do a sky switch, basically it recognizes this as the sky and this part. It doesn't look, it doesn't recognize as sky because they don't believe there is sky inside a building cantilever. Um, the structure calculation, um, extremely well done by one of our structural engineers and then inside of the space and the bigger space as multi-purpose yeah. space it can, can be used as exhibition as display performance conference having meals and then some very creative manager has predict that it will be used for weddings um, even before the completion of that space, you do see people um, having all kinds of activities there. And this is how it is, how it looks now. Um, the finishing isn't completed yet. And please notice, when you have an opening in the upper space, you do have a very unique connection between the ring on the top and the starting point of the ski jump is here. For those who has watched the live broadcast of ski jumpers, you know how popular it is for the flying cameras to get to the back of the ski jumpers. So they have the same view of the ski jumpers when they do starting and they do the start of their jump. Nowadays you don't need that, you can just sit inside the peak club and give greetings to the athletes. We plan to ask Thomas Bach to sit here and say hello um, before the athletes take their jumps. Um, I don't know whether this can be achieved. If you dare to jump in the reverse direction, this is what you see. Um, but believe me, that no athletes can do this up until now. The stadium. And this stadium is rebellious in its design because we have somehow rejected the usual very professional way of designing a ski jump stadium is to have a reversed slope. Because in, in doing that, um, the athletes can slow down much faster. So you need a much smaller stadium. But the problem is that when you do that, the stadium can only be used for ski jumping events. Do you know how many ski jumpers are there in China? Less than 100. So we have to make this useful after the games. And what is the best measurement to have an open space inside the stadium so multiple activity can take place? It's a small football field. So that's why we are doing this small, not big. Football fields are from 90 metres all the way up to 110, and this is 90. Um, the arrangements of all the seating area are exactly as in a football field because that is the common design for the common man where common activities can take place. So this is the typical mix of the superman and the common man. We haven't planned yet any event when you have ski jump doing their ski jumping and then there is a football matching match taking place in this field. That one would be surreal. So the flat stadium, the football field, it helps to have multiple events to take place. Originally, we were expecting this kind of thing to happen after Beijing 2022. But um, last December, the Herbei province, when they opened their, their provincial winter games, all the games take place elsewhere 
but they did their opening ceremony here. The lighting has nothing to do with me. It was designed by the stage designer. <laughs> so, if, if, if we somehow do a summary of what we have done in the ski jump, is like when you, when you have these light blue indicating things that would be used by the athletes and then all other colours indicating things that can be used by the common man. This is the superman, this is the common man, and look how much you can use as a common man after the games in the ski jumping centre. Okay, let's move to another jumping venue. Another day, another jump. This is Shogun. You know Shogun, right? Great. And you must have seen this one. This is called the Big Air. And it is one of the most extreme winter sports. It is the extreme sport of the extreme winter sports. But it's so extreme that in this world, in the entire globe, there are less than 1,000 athletes actually can play in this sport. And playing this sport means two things. One is tackle, one of the most common human nature, fear. And the other is to get yourself injured. Not one time, two times, three times, but over 20 times inside and inside entire career. The sport is very popular in Europe and North America, and usually in big metropolitan cities. So the best sighting of such venues is actually in an open space, a big plaza inside a metropolitan city. So when this sport is decided to be included in Beijing 2022, and they were very, of course, enthusiastic about Beijing. And they asked me, can you put our hill in Tiananmen Square? <laughs> of course not. We don't do that before Tiananmen. But the Beijing government and the Bokok, Bokok is Beijing Olympic Winter Games Organization Committee, very clever. They very quickly provided this place. Cooling towers, cooling lakes, dilapidated industrial heritage. This is even better for an extreme sport to site in than Tiananmen Square. So this is how it has become. You have the cooling towers, you have the jump, and you have all the industrial heritages nearby. And this is what you see on the Chan'an or Shogun Bridge at the extension line of Chan'an Street. And all this design has been carefully planned. So all of the geometry, remember when we do the visual reading of a space, there is some subconscious process taking place including picking up all the minor similarities in geometry. Our eyes are much more smarter than we know. They do all this kind of visual summarization and conclusion before we know them. Look, this lift and the support is in symmetrical with the cooling towers. And this has to be slightly lower than the cooling towers. You don't want your structure to break the skyline of, of the cooling towers, which has been very well known for over 40 years. So that's why actually we have sink the landing areas like this one into the lake. It is five meters below ground. So the structure when you have the takeoff, it, it's roughly the same height as the factories nearby and then the judging towers and almost the same height 
as the big factory here. This is the very hard worked effect that we have been working on for 2.5 years. We asked over 30 old factory workers who have been living here for the last maybe half century to help us to identify which is the best skyline they would recognize as Shogun. So this is actually when we do the visualization, this was the one they picked. And after the construction, we ask them again. They do accept this as, OK, this is Shogun. And another way, look, you can't do a 2.5 hours experience in the jump alone. That jump is too risky. But what you can do is you can have a loop, a cycle of experience along the lake. So we have to learn from another lake that is very well known in Beijing that people like very much. This is the Kuenming Lake in the Summer Palace. You would argue that the Summer Palace is very big, Shogun is much smaller. And you are right in saying that because um, in measurement, the Summer Palace, the Lake of Summer Palace, is four times as long as the lake in Shogun. But we can extract the typological structure from the Kuenming Lake and try to apply it in Shogun because that is how our eyes and how our minds remember and experience a space, the typological structure. As far as you can have a movement that lasts over 2.5 hours. So this is the Summer Palace, and we did this. So actually we learned from the Summer Palace and somehow translate that geometry transplant it into Shogang. Then you can have walking, you can have people sitting there looking at some visual pleasure. And that is why we created these two open spaces. One is um, a stepped um, small open space and the other is actually taking you down into the water and there's a small island here, a bridge linking the outer perimeter. And here I have to say I made a mistake and my honourable loss to a landscape architect. We were arguing um, what is the best way to finish this open space. To me I like slope. A gentle slope would be great. And he argues that if you have stepped space people will be able to sit there even if the step is very low. We discussed with each other and we lost to him. And I have to say he was right. <laughs> I was thinking about um, the disabled, the physically disabled people using wheelchairs. You, you would prefer a gentle slope. But he was thinking about the common people, the physically abled people. And this is the part I wholeheartedly encourage you to get yourself inside there. It's a great experience. And this is also a great manoeuvre done by our landscape architect. It's also from um, the architectural school of this university, Professor Zhu Yufan. And even in winter, you, you, you do have um, this very pleasant experience. Just to prove Professor Zhu Yufan's superiority compared to me, this is how it is used now, last Friday. To my surprise, people did sit down. <laughs> it is very low, it was about 20 centimeters to 23 centimeters. 
and, and how people are willing to bend down to, to take a seat. And of course, I'm um, taking pictures of this gigantic slope is one of the favourite things to do. Um, for the ski jump, not ski jump, I'm sorry, for the hill, for this... For this, um, again, it actually accommodates a competition profile. And this time, not one profile, but two profiles. Um, another story. You have quite similar sport, not as challenging as extreme as this one. A remote cousin, if you like, of Big Air, or the pre-prototype, a much easier prototype, and before Big Air was invented, um, is Ariel. Is also you take the in run and then you take the takeoff, you put yourself in the air some 10 meters above the ground and they do the landing. If you are successful, you would be a champion. If you are not, you go to hospital. And here we invited these two designers of the profiles. One is Joel Fisterold from US, He's also hap who also happens to be a competition manager of all freestyle skiing sports. And the other is Davide Tirato. And they sit together and talk to each other, and me involved, and another Belgian structural engineer. We sit in a Beijing courtyard, and then an idea came to us. Why don't we put the two sports together? So you can take two sports, not one, in this structure. But how? You have to make the profile more compatible with each other. Because when you compare the standard profile of Ariel and Big Air, it's as difficult as building another structure. And to our surprise, after a few bottles of beers, Joe and Davide somehow agreed to change their standard profiles. So the starting point and the landing point, most of almost two thirds of the entire profile, would be aligned to each other, would be the same. The only thing we need to do is here. And remember, the in run for Ariel is much narrower than the in run for Big Air. So we have the capability of using learning from carbon atoms this diamond shaped structural module when you combine them you can achieve a profile that is for the aerial on top of this big air profile and it can be done within 48 hours, actually, for skilled construction workers in China. It's less than 24 hours you can achieve that. But too bad, very unfortunate. We, we were expecting a monumental time um, when it's the first in the world, when the two sports um, being played in the same venue, a world championship or a World Cup event, and two sports played right immediately after one another within 48 hours of spam. This is world first. But the pandemic stopped us from achieving this. We have to achieve this after the Winter Games because in the Winter Games, it all has been pre-planned. The aerial would be in Genting and in Zhangjiakou and Big Air in Shougang. But anyway, the technical um, Potential is already there about colour. And um, don't ask me why it is of rainbow colour. Because the colour is decided by um, a committee inside um, Beijing. The city needs this colour and needs this colour combination, um, which is extracted from the design of all VIs, all visual um, designs for Beijing 2022. But what we can do 
is based on our reading, again, of colour inside the city, we can change the layout of the rainbows. Which part is longer? Which part is shorter? So we did this and this. To be honest, you would prefer blue and green in the city, which basically is the colour of the sky and the land. You wouldn't want much red or yellow high above in the air, and that's why we extended the gradient from blue to green, and somehow we shrinked the length between yellow and red, and make it rapidly changing to white. And this is what is it is now. I have to say, in the night it looks better <laughs> in the day. Because when, when the entire structure is lit up, um, you have this double-sided, perforated aluminum panels. Um, they interfere with each other, creating this visual flashing effect. Um, industrial structures. Um, it's very easy, actually, to transform these industrial structures. They are made with rationality. They are very logical. They are just too big for common men to use. All, the way, all we need to do is to break down the larger space into the more human scale spaces. So this is before and after. For this particular gigantic factory building, we asked a team from Polito. Polito is a friend university and with Tsinghua. A very, we have very good connection. And the Polito team, they have been involved in the design of the Pagodora inside the city of Turin, um, which is very famous um, for its use of a gigantic um, industrial structure. And here they did it again, um, Albert not leaving an open space and playgrounds in the ground, but hanging all these floors, office spaces above. And they did the same, which is to strip the building down to its original structure and leave the gigantic structure sit right in front of you. Kudos to the Polito team in doing what they do best. The rest of the factory, the other structures, were modified and redesigned by us. This is the cooling station. It is used again as the cooling station. But nowadays, all the cooling machines are much smaller. So for these five openings, actually, in each one of these openings, it can host now four machines rather than one. And all you need is 16. Then one hole can be left to be viewed by people. Everything on the ground maintains the original fabric inside the factory and everything above, and the additional space, it's in perpendicular to the original fabric. Some of the cylinders were kept, cleaned, and then would be used by people. I found it particularly interesting because young men and young women seem to like to sit beneath the cylinders very much. And of course, for the structure itself, and most of these designs were done for the athletes, for protection, but also for their views when they appear from the lift and before they jump again, that common man moment of these supermen. And this time they have a view of jumping into a gigantic factory. Imagine yourself being an iron atom. Fortunately, it has hosted um, one of the last um, test events of Beijing 2022. That was before the pandemic. That was before coronavirus in December of 2019. And look at this. And you have the gigantic industrial heritage and then the athletes doing the jumps. It looks very surreal. Of course, if they could jump 
from the cylinders, it would be better. Rock music at the intervenes. So I have to say, to me, all the game structure, or the venues for big events like the Olympic Games, they are designed for particular use, for particular bodies that are not common, that are anything but common. If we want these structures to be used more often in the time, in the entire life of the building after the Games, we really need to program all those things that speaks to the bodies of our common man. Whether this was be achieved, would be proved in real life, we have to wait and see, but at least we have tried. Thank you very much indeed. That, I think, concludes our live session of this class.